Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. We're delighted today to speak uh, with Adafna Levitt, self-described subversive peacenik and author of, among others, Wrestling with Zionism, Jewish Voices of Dissent, which I enjoyed the Daphne reading very much. While, while it's an overview, I mean, I, I, you know, I've written a little bit, but I really have appreciated what you wrote because while it's an overview, you provide enough detail of more than 20 uh, dissenting Jewish voices to give us a real window into their lives and their minds. And of course, each one's going to deserve much more time than we'll give them today. But what we'll do this afternoon, Daphne, is to take a brief tour of some of these dissenting Jewish voices. So, so welcome and, and tell us, uh, how are you doing during the pandemic? Are, are you remaining well? Yeah, I think I'm still normal. <laughs> I think I'm managing. And in Nova Scotia, how are things there? Yeah, Nova Scotia has been very proud of itself because I think last week we maybe had one case. Um, so we're not exactly, you know, right in the in the worst of it. We, we've been doing really well. In fact, um, there was supposed to be a whole bunch of vaccines coming our way, but they were shipped out of Nova Scotia to the north where people are struggling, north in Canada, where people are struggling more. So I haven't been anywhere near anywhere or anyone who is giving vaccines. So I'm not sure if I will ever get them, but by the time they distribute it, I will certainly be of that age. <laughs> well, just by way of introduction, let's, let's jump right on in. Just by way of introduction, you had quite an interesting route to your activism from Israel and military service to international financial institutions, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, uh, Wall Street, to work with B'Tselem, ICAD, Gush Shalom, Maxim Watch, and others. So tell us a little bit about your awakening and your journey to activism. So I think that um, in my book, if, if you've read it, I, I talk a little bit about the fact that in Israel, when you grow up, you, um, I grew up in a very secular country, the country that had very little to do with religion. And the religion that we had was Zionism. And we believed that our God was Israel and that we should be willing to sacrifice our lives for that religion, patriotism and our God. And I think it took um, a lot of time before my mind was able to sort out that there was something that wasn't quite right about this um, theology. And when I was a soldier, um, I'll date myself, I was a soldier during the Six Day War. And um, I was a press liaison officer and I stood on Allenby Bridge and I watched Palestinian refugees fleeing. And I kept thinking, there's something wrong here because we're the good guys. Why are they fleeing? And after a, a lot of reading and a lot of conversations, a lot of dialogue, I came to the conclusion that maybe there is something wrong about the Zionist mythology. That was the beginning, I guess, of my journey. You know, I Let's, I want to jump right on in and let's just get right into the meat of your book. Uh, at the very beginning, I, I thought it was an interesting pairing in your second chapter. You pair Martin Buber and Albert Einstein, the, the scholar of Hasidic mysticism and the internationally acclaimed uh, scientist. And at the end of the chapter, you talk about why you paired these two. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You know, I forgot, but let me go <laughs> look at my book. I think that <laughs> I think that the 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 reason that um, I paired them was what I was trying to do in this book was to show that the 
Descent from Zionism, the history of descent from Zionism covers an incredibly broad spectrum and that people who wrote or thought about this problem were not monolithic. They came from entirely different points of view, perspectives, places in the world. Now, Zionism was really an, um, a West European construct in, in the Jewish Zionism. I also talk a little bit about Christian Zionism, but Jewish Zionism, which is a derivative, really came from, from, from West, um, a Western European construct. And Albert Einstein came from a secular Western European background. Martin Buber came from East European. And there is an enormous divide in the history of European Judaism between East and Western European um, Jewry, where the Jews of the East, the Jews of Russia and Poland and some of the other countries were not as um, readily willing to either assimilate or to abandon um, their, their sort of diasporic lifestyle. Buber came from that. And yet the two of them who were, I think, born maybe a year apart, representing completely different um, backgrounds and, and, and life lifestyles, works, uh, came to very similar conclusions. Buber came to um, Israel with the idea of creating not necessarily a political entity, but a spiritual entity, that Israel would be um, Zionism born in the soul, that it would be a Jewish concept. It would be not the secular militant nation that it has evolved into. And Einstein came to it really because he himself was an incredibly strong believer in pacifism and um, the, the abolishment of any military, milita militarism in the world. So they come to it from very different perspectives, but they reach the same conclusion. That's what's wrong with Israel and what's going to be the problem for Israel in the future is going to be this incredible um, turn towards a political identity, which basically involves a very strong army. Um, and Israel has been declared a, a country, a, an army with a country rather than a country with an army. So I, that's why I kind of drew the two of them together. There are other pairings that I could have done, but that to me was very striking that the two of them, one very secular, and one Buber who was very involved in the Hasidic movement. If you're not Jewish, you might not know what that is, but that I suppose is identified with Jewish mysticism. Yeah. You know, it was interesting, just a little anecdote uh, uh, that you included about uh, uh, Einstein when uh, President uh, Chaim Weizmann died in 1952. Uh, he turned down the offer to become, Einstein did, to become Israel's uh, uh, president, his se second president. And he mentions to his stepdaughter, Margot, if I were to be president, sometime I would have to say to the Israeli people things they would not like to hear. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, one, one of the lesser known, uh, at least to me, figures you discussed was the scholar and doctor Yeshayahu uh, Leibowitz, a secular Zionist who saw the, uh, the dangers of mixing religion and state. And, and you write, he was among the first Jewish intellectuals distressed that the Holocaust had to a large extent become the new Jewish religion. And then the reason I, the reason I was drawn to ask you uh, was that a couple uh, uh, paragraphs later, you mentioned our, our, our buddy, Mark Ellis, and that this new religion places the Jewish people rather than God at its center. So uh, you want to say a few more words about him? Yeah, I hate to cor correct you. Sure, please. <laughs> Forgive me, but he was never, never secular. He was a very orthodox Jew. Ah, okay, okay. Um, and um, Ishayahu Leibovitz is considered among the most popular, I suppose, leaders of Israel to this day, even though most people, uh, you know, in their 40s and younger probably aren't the, as familiar with him. Yeah, he was I, a I philosopher. Was 
Yeah, he, 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 you can find him if you speak Hebrew, <laughs> you can find his teachings on YouTube where he gives lectures. He was enormously charismatic. Um, his his uh, people were drawn to his classes. Um, and he wrote a lot about um, about the abuse of religion um, in the Jewish mythology, in the Zionist mythology, because for him, like for Buber, but even slightly differently, for Ishayao Leibovitz, Zionism was important. And in the beginning of his career, he wanted to make sure that rabbis understood the significance um, of the Zionist state, that Israel needed to exist. But eventually what he became very um, upset about was the fact that people were using um, the, the Zionist mythology, they were using the Bible as their geography book. And that was a diminishment of the holiness of the, of the scripture. For him that you don't question excuse me, you don't question God, you accept him entirely. And that basically being a Jew was work. Um, he was very upset at things like laws that were enacted by politicians to preserve as a small example, I write about it in the book, to preserve the Sabbath. Um, if you've been to Israel, you would know that in Israel, the Sabbath means there's no public transport. That's just one example. There's no, no public transport on the high holidays. These were legislated by the government. And he objected to the fact that the government would legislate something that should be part of a Jewish consciousness. Why is the government intervening in decisions like that? Um, I totally, if, if there is one person in this book who is my favorite, it would be him. Ah. Yeah, he's an amazing man, uh, an amazing thinker. Um, I don't know if I brought him um, to life as much as I should. And it, really, if, if there's one, there may be two here that I think Hebrew is essential to actually approach them, he would be one. Well, that's your next book after your book on Hannah Arendt. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to attempt a book on Hannah Arendt. There are too many people better equipped for that. Uh, uh, th th this is a common thread uh, that runs through many of your dissenting voices. The criticism of Israel exceptionalism, which is similar to what we experience in our country, American exceptionalism. And this is especially true of Noam's, Noam Chomsky. American exceptionalism as manifest destiny uh, is, is, biblical, is the biblical great commission shorn of its religious content. And Israel exceptionalism as Zionism is the biblical promised land and the light to the nations shorn of its religious content. Talk about Zionism as a secular religion a little bit more than you already have, and especially Chomsky's critique. Well, Chomsky's been critical a lot <laughs> for a lot of different things about Israel. But let me start with the fact that the Zionist movement started with um, secular thinkers in, in Western Europe who succumbed to the zeitgeist of the time that was um, seeking national identity. Um, it was a very strong movement. We wanted to be nations. And this was at the end of the 19th century. The Jews who had always lived among others um, in order to live among others, made several choices. And one of the choices that predominated in Western Europe was to assimilate. That assimilation meant that they spoke the language of the culture that they lived in. They learned in the schools of the country, culture that they lived in and kept their Jewish identity for the private domain of their houses. Um, the Jews of Eastern Europe stayed Jewish in appearance. They kept living a lifestyle that distinguished them. You could see what a Jew looked like. You could go to a Jewish community where you couldn't do that in Germany. The German Jews had assimilated. It seems interesting that the most 
uh, violent measures against the Jews were taken in the country where the Jews had assimilated the best um, in Germany. Um, hmm. But um, but to say a little bit more about this, so, so the secular movement that was Zionism was the movement in which I grew up. There was nothing religious about my upbringing. I could barely, I, I really barely knew the Bible. I had to study it for classes, but for, you, teach, you learn the Bible in elementary school, you learn the Bible in high school, but it's, it's a required reading, yeah? <laughs> but, but it was not part of my world, my, my Weltanschauung. It wasn't anything to do with what, I believed or thought or, or, or understood. Um, but over time, Israel has become to some extent uh, more, um, what is it, reliant on the religion of Judaism and the experience of the Holocaust to justify its conti continued existence and to justify what it can um, do to people who have lived there for generations that are not identified as Jews. And this, I suppose, is my own personal <clears throat> feeling of incredible guilt. Yeah. Now, I, you know, even as you, this is just a personal comment, Daphne, but even as I was reading your chapters, as you were describing others, you could see you had a way of, of, of weaving your heart throughout each one of the chapters and your own kind of story uh, as it was evolving. So that's another thing I appreciated about uh, your book. Ch two other critiques from Chomsky that you mentioned. Number one, states do not have a right to exist. I mean, that's clear, right? And anybody who knows anything about Chomsky uh, and his critique of Israel, knows that, uh, that he says that very clearly. And the other one, Israel and, and the United States, he includes, both view the Palestinians in strictly utilitarian terms, how useful they are to the West. So here's Chomsky on that. There seems to be no room in Israel for those who try to square a universalist point of view, be it liberal or socialist, with the racist definition of Zionism. So you can pick one or both of those, but... Uh, yeah, uh, it just it just dawned on me that I totally ignored your earlier reference to Chomsky. Oh, that's okay. Carried sure. away by something else, a different I, thought stream. So yeah. if if you read the Chomsky reader, which is sort of his own autobiographical sort of narrative, he says that he too had been, uh, I kind of identify with Chomsky. Um he too had been a Zionist, uh, an incredibly, uh, a secular a Zionist, but a Zionist. Um, and he went to Israel to live on a kibbutz. And when he was at a kibbutz, one thing that struck him was that no Arab was ever accepted as a member of the kibbutz. And that only uh, Jews, even if Arabs came to work at the kibbutz, they were not accepted as members of the kibbutz. And that really struck him. He felt that there was an inability to sort of expand the idea of um, brotherhood and community to the other. And that really struck Chomsky. And then he um, later writes a lot with another person who is in this book, Ilan Pape. He wrote several books together with Ilan Pape, which then sort of castigate America's role in perpetuating the Israeli myth, in perpetuating the myth of Israel. It started out perhaps as a political ally to the United States because it needed an ally in this part of the world, which was burning, <laughs> which was uh, you know, a difficult part of the world to understand. And it felt that through Israel, it could maintain some degree of control. This is Chomsky's orientation, obviously being an American and being critical of American foreign policy. But he's scathing about Bibi Netanyahu's idea that people have to, um, that the Arabs or the Palestinians have to acknowledge that Israel is a Jewish state. 
So for me, and I go into this in the book, the whole idea of a Jewish state means that you can't have it both ways. Are you a democracy or are you a Jewish state? You know, you can't be both. If you're a Jewish state, you are excluding other people who live there and who have lived there for a long time. To recognize Israel as a Jewish state means that all those people, and there are millions, are no longer valid citizens of that state. You and know, uh, it, it's a wonderful segue uh, to your chapter on Uri of Neri. Uh, you quote one of his well-known stories, uh, "When God Despairs," and and you know many of us in the in in the activist movement use this analogy or use this sort of parable, but I, I didn't know where it came from, and so I really appreciated that. And I'm just going to quote uh, the, the the story as you quote it uh, in the book. Right after the foundation of Israel, God appeared to David Ben Gurion and told him, "You have done good by my people." Utter a wish and I shall grant it. I wish that Israel shall be Jewish, democratic, and encompass all the country between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. And God exclaimed, that is too much even for me. I'll grant you two of the three. Uh, uh, so it was a wonderful segue from your Chomsky to this. But like I said, I didn't know where this story had come from. Say a little bit more about Evneri and maybe this story. So Uli Avneri is a friend of mine, was. Oh. Um, yeah, and hopefully, um, uh, I was, I was going to show you a picture of Uli Avneri and me, but I can't find it, so never mind, I wasn't. There's a picture of Uli Avneri and me wearing um, our uh, Gush Shalom, which is Uli Avneri's parties. Um, it means peace block t-shirt and signs that said, no settler is my brother. Um, and by that, we were referring to the settlers who came to basically take <laughs> land and annex um, whatever property that the government would let them get away with. And more and more of that is happening. Uliyev Neri was a Yilgun member, which means he was an extreme right wing militant when he came to Israel from Germany. And over time, he too transformed. Um, it's very difficult when you are so convinced of the righteousness of your um, ideology to then suddenly um, teach yourself that there are things wrong with that um, ideology. Um, but he did, and he is a so uh, he's an autodidact. He never actually studied anywhere. His wealth of, of literary knowledge and his Hebrew were beyond compare. He, he writes Hebrew, it flows out of his fingers. It's just beautiful and funny and eloquent. Um, for a long time, when I was a member of Gush Shalom in Israel, I was one of his translators, not the only one, but a lot of his articles uh, I actually translated. And I think that his, his delightful writing is, is, works in English too. Um, he founded um, Gush Shalom. He went to demonstrations. He organized various conferences. He, he was very active and, um, and I'm still devastated by his death. Sure. No, no, for sure. You were a close associate. I mean, friends, I mean, you were, you were close to the two of you. Yeah. Well, I was close to Uri Avneri and his wife, Rachel, who precede, pre, predeceased him. But yeah, we were very close. We attended various, um, 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 events. Um, we, we I have tons of photographs of Uri Avneri because Rachel was a photographer. So there are lots of photographs of, of Uri and, and other ones of, you know, that group. I, I don't want to get any further into this conversation uh, without giving you a chance, uh, us together to talk about Hannah Arendt. Uh, before before we uh, came on uh, today, 
I, you know, you were, you were telling me about how you're uh, offering this kind of uh, uh, adult continuing studies class about Hannah Arendt. And I said, it's a real shame that she's so irrelevant to what's happening in the world today. And we both had a laugh about that. Uh, uh, so you, you've been, we talked about uh, Hannah Arendt being both prescient and prophetic about the rise of totalitarianism in the West. Talk to us a little bit more about what draws you to her and why why she just remains uh, so relevant uh, in our day. I think that she's unique in the way that she approached the world. And I think that the world has been looking for someone who thinks through the human condition, how it is that humanity has been capable of such incredible beauty and at the same time of such incredible evil. And she's thinking about it in a different way. She created a, 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 a lifetime of, of, of work, of thinking about these issues. My own experience with Hannah Arendt and her appearance in, in, in this book is through obviously um, Eichmann in Jerusalem, yeah. the banality of evil. Um, I keep telling people this, and it's going to be, I think, on my tombstone. My <laughs> sister was a stenographer at the trial. <laughs> and so every time, this is, this is my personal contact to, that's the closest I'll ever be to Hannah Arendt. But um, yeah, I think that in the, in the, what is it, in the ostracizing of Hannah Arendt by Israel, in the fact that none of her works were ever translated into Hebrew until maybe a decade after her death, in the fact that she said one of the most prophetic things, which is a country that my neighbor does not consider a home will never be a home. In other words, she was very upset with the fact that Israel was becoming increasingly militant and that the trial of Eichmann was done primarily as a show to justify Zionism. It was intended by Ben-Gurion, and she quotes a conversation with Ben-Gurion in which the whole purpose of this trial was really not to judge whether Eichmann were guilty or innocent because it's clear that he was guilty. Exactly what he was guilty of is the controversy, but he was guilty. And she didn't even object to the death penalty because she felt that a man who committed such crimes really didn't belong to humanity. And it was good that he was executed, but she was ostracized because she dared to say that Eichmann was not a monster and that Eichmann was not responsible for the entire um, disaster that occurred during the Holocaust. And that even Jews who were what she calls worldless, not wordless, but worldless, had some um, responsibility for what happened. The idea that the Jews had any responsibility for what happened to them um, so completely infuriated the Jewish community and still does to this day that they didn't actually think what it is that she was exploring here, which was much beyond whether or not um, the, the Jews had a right to a state and whether or not the Nazis were horrible. She wrote an entire book preceding this because the origins of totalitarianism came out in the 1950s and the Eichmann book was in 1963. So right. even before that, she had concentrated very much on the horrors of totalitarian regimes, but she was analyzing them as a philosopher, which she later didn't want to be anymore, but that's okay. <laughs> Damn those philosophers, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my favorite quotes, I want to stay with Hannah Arendt just for a minute. One, one of the quotes that I have used uh, often and, uh, and, and it's so applicable and relevant for today, it's just a few sentences. So let me quote it and then I'd like your reaction, especially about our present time in our country and even in other places in Europe. Mm. 
Mass propaganda discovered that its audience was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd, and did not particularly object to being deceived because it held every statement to be a lie anyhow. The totalitarian, the totalitarian mass leaders based their propaganda on the correct psychological assumption that under such conditions, one could make people believe the most fantastic statements one day and trust that if the next day they were given irrefutable proof of their falsehood, they take refuge in a cynical belief that there was no such thing as truth instead of deserting the leaders who had lied to them. And then here's the punchline. The result of a consistent and total substitution of lies for factual truth is not that the lie will now be accepted as truth, but that the sense by which we take our bearings in the real world, the category of truth itself is being destroyed. There is, a, it's not that people believe the lie, it's just that they stop believing that there is a truth, right? I mean, that's, that's, and that's what we've seen in our country or, you know, and other places as well. Please react if you'd like. So one of the things that, you know, keep, <laughs> this is personal. I don't know if any of you shared this experience except for, what's his name? The guy, uh, the Germ the Austrian governor, Schwarzenegger shared that experience. When I watched the January 6th storming um, of your capital, um, I had the same reaction that Schwarzenegger had. It was a, a kind of a violent hit to my stomach. It looked like Kristallnacht. And I don't know if you saw, but Schwarzenegger did a little YouTube video about how it reminded him of Kristallnacht, and that is the swarming of a mob out of control against a symbol of something that they were going to demolish, that they didn't have to think about, but that was what they wanted to demolish. And in her analysis of totalitarian regime, or even before that, even without getting to the point of a totalitarian regime, she talks about ideologies. And that ideologies sometimes will replace the need for thinking because you don't need any other explanation. You have your ideology to live with. You don't have to reflect on it. So in a sense, people who have been, um, what is it, brainwashed? And, and I feel that because I was brainwashed as a Zionist. I really resent that. I spent many years being brainwashed, but people who are brainwashed into an ideology, feel that it has all the answers and that there is no need to question anything anymore. So if you don't need to question, why do you need to think? And that's what I saw on, I don't know if the rest of you feel that that was an exaggerated reaction, but that's how I felt on January 6th. It was, it, I, <laughs> I stayed sick for three days, and there are people here on this call who can attest to that. <laughs> I have a question from one of our friends uh, online here, uh, Pastor Fahed Abu Akhl, um, uh, an activist Palestinian uh, minister from Atlanta. How do you explain U.S. Jews stand on Israel? They've been leaders in the civil rights, black and human rights for all, but when it comes to Israel, most of them are quiet. Uh, at best, right, and even antagonistic about Palestinian rights. So I feel that one of the reasons that, say, Chomsky and other American Jewish writers have, have commented on the U.S. stance on Israel as a political ally, the reason Israel was a political ally changed over time, but it remained an ally. It also remained a voting block. And many of the political leaders have perceived the Jewish community as monolithic. And if they are monolithic, it means that we will take the IPAC or whatever the Jewish Defense League or whatever that position is, which seems to be the loudest, and we will support that. I think that that's changing. I'm hoping that that's changing. I think that there are other Jews 
I have encountered them who are thinking differently and who eventually will take a stand against Israel's policies. Because how can you study, how can you even read some of the reports from Gaza and from other places that Israel has occupied in the West Bank and the treatment of Palestinians as a human being without eventually questioning how we can support that. So yes, I think the Jews have been puzzled because for so long they have accepted the Zionist myth. And I know that I myself have aggravated many Jews by opening my mouth. I've given lectures where people will come and scream traitor, treasonous things at me. I've had things thrown at me. So I know that, you know, what I'm saying here, you know, I still get emails from why are you, why are you besmirching our country? Why are you saying these horrible things about us? And that's maybe, you know, a, a point of view that's really hard for them to relinquish, but it's also hard for me as a thinking human being to relinquish my position. So I'm hoping that people will, if we, if we write, if we, if we publish, publish, if we talk about what's going on, especially in Gaza, how can that happen? How can we have a prison of so many people with absolutely zero right to freedom? That's just not tolerable. The whole, uh, uh, the numerous attacks on Gaza uh, in the last 15 years, particularly, have moved a number of uh, Jews like yourself uh, uh, to become uh, activists. Uh, we, we know our, our Rabbi Brant Rosen, for example, and others in this country, other friends for whom that's been the case. You know, um, the, this was worth the price of the book uh, uh, in and of itself, to be honest with you. I, I didn't know that history was such a blood sport, although I should have. Uh, we, could, we could spend a day or two talking about the new historians, right? Uh, uh, Can I just uh, say one thing about Gaza? Sure, please. Just, just quickly, um, because you just led me into this. Uh, some of you might remember Operation Cast Lead, which occurred um, in 2008. It was a massive 22-day military assault on the Gaza Strip. So many people were killed, among them 1,400 Palestinians and countless others were injured. That is why uh, when I was already safe and sconced in Nova Scotia away from the madness, I decided that I had to write this book, which was the book that preceded. It's called Israeli Rejectionism. I co-wrote it. It's a document of how Israel has consistently for the past 80 years rejected every opportunity that it was given for peace. And if there are people here who are pro-Israel, I'm so glad that on the Zoom, you can't throw tomatoes at me. <laughs> well, thank you for picking up uh, uh, Operation Cast Lead and for just raising that again to our attention. That was really what uh, uh, pushed Brant Rosen over the edge to become really much more of an activist, Rabbi Rosen, and many others in this country who had been, who had been activists, who had been sensitive to uh, 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 dissenting from Zionism, but really then what animated their activism in a very strong way. So thank you for that. So talking about the new historians, uh, uh, Benny Morris, right? Uh, uh, his shocking justification for ethnic cleansing. He says, when, when, you know, when, when the other choice is the annihilation of your people, you have to choose ethnic cleansing. I mean, wow. Uh, and and uh, the justifiable attacks on his racist and politicized scholarship by Avi Shlaim, Ilan Pape, Gideon Levy. I mean, you document all this uh, in your book. And then you leave us with Morris's conclusion. This place will decline. I mean, this even, this even shows, right, his, uh, his uh, 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 racism. This place will decline like a Middle Eastern state with an Arab majority, if in fact 
peace breaks out, right? The violence between the different populations within the state will increase. The Arabs will demand the return of refugees. The Jews will remain a small minority within a large Arab sea of Palestinians, a persecuted or slaughtered minority as they were when they lived in Arab countries. Those among the Jews who can will flee to America and the West. You know, for many, Benny Morris's early, early work was so good. And then, but the conclusion, I mean, he, he made this sort of, I don't know if it was a, a shift or an evolution or if it was just always there, but it was really astounding. And these other historians really called him out on it. Yeah, he was a mystery to us all. And the publisher of Wrestling with Zionism is a Palestinian. Um, I hope you all support Interlink Books because he's an amazing person, a musician, um, scholar. But anyway, he and the, the editor who I worked with were upset that I said so much about Benny Morris. Why couldn't I just leave him out? Leave him out of the session. <laughs> But he was really crucial because he did start out with such an incredible amount of research on the subject and such a great deal of, um, of enthusiasm. And the fact that he later becomes, I don't know what happened to him, but he succumbs to, to, to the myth, to the Zionist myth. And I don't get it, but he needed to be there. Well, so, I, uh, and what, what's really important is the way you, you document, like I said, Avi Schleim's critique of uh, Morris, Ilan Pape's, and then uh, you skip a few chapters, and then Gideon Levy at, Levy at the end, uh, uh, his criticism of him as well. So let, 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 me, uh, uh, let me ask you, we'll, we'll get to uh, uh, Ilan and uh, Gideon in a second, but let, let me ask you, issues of Jewish identity run throughout your book, Daphne. Uh, and as a non-Jew, I want to ask you about this with some sensitivity, but it appears to me that Zionists define Jewish identity in whatever way suits their argument at the time. So sometimes their Jewishness is a cultural identity. Sometimes it's an ethnic identity. Sometimes it's used as a religious identity, depending on their audience. You know, uh, for example, if they're talking to Christian Zionists, um, do you know what? I, I guess I, there's a question in there somewhere, but this. So the this, question I have to you is, are you talking about one Jew, an individual Jew, or are you talking about the various Jews that you encounter? Because I think that I have always been a secular Jew, or I would define myself as an atheist. Others define me as a Jew. I, I, I don't care. It's fine. Historically, that's what I am. Well, I was when, talking about how Zionists define, when, yeah, how Zionists when, define their Judaism, and right. sometimes it morphs depending on the audience, you know? Right, but other people who will consider themselves Zionists will usually in, say, uh, I don't know, over the majority of Israelis will, would consider themselves secular Zionists. We have a new phenomena, and interestingly enough, I would, I don't have an empirical number for you, but I would venture to say that a large majority of them come from the United States because they speak English with Boston or Brooklyn accents, and they <laughs> define themselves as Jewish. And they are the ones who believe that the Jews have a right to that land. And they are the ones who basically are creating an awful lot of trouble today because Bibi Netanyahu needs them and has given them more and more of a prominent role in determining Israeli policy, which is scary because they are the ones who want to annex. They, want, they are looking for the greater Israel, that particularly extreme right nationalistic um, ambition of the early <laughs> extremely secular Zionists. So the fact that you are confused makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for that affirmation. Uh, we had the pleasure of interviewing Ilan Pape last October, and he's promised to come to Fort Wayne 
uh, once the travel restrictions are lifted. Is that Can I come together with him? I want to be there. I know Elon from Israel. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> His ethnic cleansing of Palestine is required reading, of course, in yes. the in the activist community. And he, he told me his The Forgotten Palestinians was very emotional for him as he wrote it because it was talking about many of his friends, uh, uh, Palestinian 48, uh, who, who uh, he, uh, are his friends. But let's focus on, on one of his talks, which you quote from, the title of which is All You Need to Know About His Analysis, Viewing Israel-Palestine Through the Lens of Settler Colonialism. It really marks a progression for many in the activist community over the last decade or more, right, from occupation. I mean, we had to move from conflict to occupation, and now we're moving from occupation to settler colonialism, right? I mean, as an analysis. Uh, so say more about that. I'm not sure what to say. I mean, what you're saying is absolutely true, you know. We have this, uh, you know, settler colonialist uh, stream within Israel that is, to me, probably the most terrifying and the most damaging politically for the, if there is a future for Israel. I have to say that in my first book in Israeli Rejectionism, I was very despondent and concluded that there is really no hope for Israel. Maybe I now feel that there could be some hope for Israel because of so many activist groups within Israel and outside of Israel. One of the groups outside of Israel in the United States that gives me hope is Black Lives Matter, about which I wrote an article for a magazine called Rabble. I don't know if you get that in the States. It's an online magazine. But a lot of groups within Israel who are young people who refuse to serve, who refuse to be colonialists. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, uh, thank you for that. You know, um, we've got a number of questions here and I, I, it kind of leads to my next question. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna mention this later, we're gonna be um, interviewing Jeff Halper and a Palestinian political scientist stick together. Uh, Ilan uh, Pape, along with Jeff, are part of the One Democratic State campaign uh, with a number of Palestinian Israelis. Uh, tell us a little bit about your view of the One Democratic State, not, not just maybe that narrow one, but one state. I mean, we're beyond the two states, right? We're now moving toward a one state or a confederation of some kind. Um, talk to us a little bit about your view of the one state. So there's what you want and then there's what there is. And what there is, is a one state. What there isn't is democracy. I don't think it's possible at this point for um, the sort of utopian uh, two-state solution to occur um, because Israel has control of the purse strings. It has all the... Um, institutions that make it possible to run a country. The Palestinians have not been given any opportunity to do that. Um, so I think that what is, is a one state. What has to happen is for that one state to acknowledge that that is the only way forward. And that one state has to be democratic and has to grant equal rights to everyone living within it. I know that that's an aspiration that the United States has not yet achieved also, but I'm hoping that <laughs> Israel can do that um, at some point because it's ridiculous the way that you have within this tiny, tiny country, which is smaller than Nova Scotia, the smallest province in Canada, which is where I live. This tiny, tiny country has byways and highways with checkpoints and roads in which Palestinians and roads for it, it's monstrous. It's a monstrous creation. Came out of some sort of evil demonic mind. It has to be a one state with equal rights. How we get there, <laughs> help, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah. just write about what is and you sure. know. You know, uh... 
Ter you met Terry before, Terry Doherty. Uh, Ron yeah, he's the one hiding behind the Indiana <laughs> Center for Middle East Peace, right? Yeah, right. And uh, uh, Ron Caldwell and I, a number of years ago, another board member had lunch with Gideon Levy in a cafeteria in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've hosted Amir Haas here in Fort Wayne and, and both multi award winning Israeli journalists. Uh, uh, Levy writes in support of a one state solution. I'll just quote, the conclusion is unavoidable. If there's no longer any chance for two nation states, there's no longer any room for the left to talk about Zionism. Only two alternatives to two states, an apartheid state or a democratic state, which would be binational. Uh, it seconds what you were saying. And Amira Haas, and I'll let you then respond, born to two Holocaust survivors, her column today in Haaretz picks up on what you were just saying. Yeah. Right, the headline, Palestinians should drag architects of the settlements to the International Criminal Court. Um, you share a particular story that she relates of her mother in Bergen-Belsen, in which, uh, in which uh, uh, she saw that for, uh, for her was an image, uh, a loathsome symbol of watching from the sidelines. Uh, do you remember that story? Oh, yeah. uh, uh, you, you share that with us and how the experiences of her parents have really formed her and shaped her. Well, she basically... <laughs> didn't want the horrors that her mother had to go through to be the horrors that she and her country inflict on others. This was her driving, the driving force for Amira Haas, who has lived an incredible life. She's lived in Ramallah. She's lived in the various occupied territories for years. She's learned the language. She constantly writes. Her, you know, her point of departure is the very fact that she herself was, a, you know, the daughter of, of Holocaust survivors, which meant that she took that burden upon herself not to not to compete in the in the contest for the ultimate victim, which many Israelis think that they are competing in, but rather to become a better human being, to be able to give to people who need it not oppression, but support. And that's what she's been doing her entire life. Within Israel, she has been um, a sort of enigma because there are a lot of right-wing Israelis who detest her. Yeah. Not quite as much as they detest Gidon Levy. I mean, <laughs> Gidon Levy has a hate group, I tell you, it's huge. Um, and I happen to really love them both, so yeah. About, uh, um, I see that we only have a few more minutes left uh, uh, in our hour. Uh, about your own story, Daphne, uh, you quote from Hannah Arendt on your Facebook page last year relating to your own journey. I've been thinking a lot about forgiving lately for my own personal transgressions as well as those of others. And then you quote from her tradition of political thought, forgiving attempts the seemingly impossible to undo what has been done and that succeeds making a new beginning where beginnings seem to have become no longer possible, usually in a non-political context. Forgiving is among the greatest of human virtues. That was very confessional um, uh, on your part. Uh, uh, were these, have these books been cathartic for you? or, or I, I don't get the sense that they've just been merely intellectual academic exercises. Uh, talk to us a little bit about these as part of your journey. You mean the Hannah Arendt books or in general? The, the... Uh, uh, yeah, and, and yes, uh, uh, and this latest book, uh, right. So I have been struggling with Hannah Arendt because it's obviously if you read her that she's not um, an easy read. You, you have to sort of work with her writing and her writing changes over time and her thoughts change and one thing builds on another. And in the human condition, she basically talks about three essential conditions. And I'm gonna maybe say things a little bit, it's, it's hard because I'm, I'm not fully articulate yet with the course that I'm about to launch into, but anyway. 
She talks about labor, work, and action. Um, these are concepts that she has developed. And action is where um, you basically um, act with other people to be able to create new beginnings. And the new beginnings are also part of forgiveness. In the act of forgiving, it is possible not to erase, erase the past, but to create space for something new to happen where that past is no longer your reality. And I think it's very complex, but it helps me. It helps me think that if I can, if I can engage in action, and it's getting harder to, to do that, especially since I live on an isolated island with 40 inhabitants off the Atlantic Sea, that it's very difficult for me to act in um, a political sense. But Hannah Arendt really felt that that was part of the most essential, um, I suppose, gift, action, um, that a human being could participate in to be human. One last question. Um, if I were to write a sequel, if I were to write a sequel, uh, Daphna, of Jewish Voices of Dissent to Zionism, I'd include people like Jeff Halper, Rebecca Vilcomerson, uh, formerly uh, uh, the head of JVP, Josh Rubner, Brant Rosen, Alyssa Wise, and some others. Um, who, who would you include and why? So when you include this list, yours is primarily based on American. Of course. Uh, the reason the book that I chose was really other with, with maybe a few exceptions, people who either had fully immersed themselves in Israel or were tangentially part of Israel. And in the epilogue to my book, I think I mentioned the ones that I would probably include that I didn't have room for because the, <laughs> the publisher had a, had a word limit, but I would probably include Meron Benvenisti, Jeff Halper, Chaim Hanegbi, Adam Keller, Moshe Machover, Akiva Or, Yaakov Rabkin, Mikhail Vershavsky, Edith Zertal and Beata Silverson. Those are the ones that I would include. And in fact, I've often thought about them, but these are obviously unknown to a large extent, except maybe Jeff Alper, um, to most Americans. And the reason I would do that, and you probably wouldn't, is because I can read Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and I, uh, uh, I saw these in your epilogue, and I wanted to give you a chance to maybe pick one or two of them uh, and tell us why you'd include them. Maybe uh, well, a, a prelude <laughs> to the next book. So when I talk about, um, in the book, I talk about a woman called Tikva Honik Parnas, who was and is, um, she's about the age of Uri of Neri. Um, she's a, she's a, um, a socialist, an extreme socialist. Um, and she belonged to an organization called Matspin, which in Hebrew means compass. And the founders of that were Moshe Markover and Akiva Or. And I would really love to write a book, but it wouldn't be the first book about Matspen. Matspen is probably one of the most influential voices of opposition um, from a socialist perspective to the state of Israel. Tikva Honid Kpanas said that you cannot possibly be a socialist, which Israel wanted to present itself to the world in the original um, Zionist narrative as Israel is a socialist democracy. She says, you cannot possibly be a socialist and a colonialist at the same time. So I would really like to sort of, if I were to do that, work on that angle. Um, and some of the others are people that I know and respect and think that they have an interesting story. You list a number of organizations here too uh, in the epilogue to your book, uh, activist organizations. You know, uh, you would know this obviously much better than myself. Uh, the the Jewish left, the Israeli, the Israeli left, uh, has has had high days, low days, more activist, you know, more non-activist days. 
say a word about how important it was. You know, B'Tselem just came out with this statement about Israel as an apartheid state. And it, it, it still, I don't know that it's, it's been mentioned in the mainstream media all that much here in the United States. Uh, it's been largely ignored, uh, except for those kinds of media uh, outlets that we activists kind of, uh, 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 you know, tune into, you know. But, but it seems to me that that was a, a very, very important statement uh, for an Israeli human rights organization to make. I don't know if it's a game changer, but it, 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 it's approaching it, at least in my own thinking. What, what do you think about it? I well, mean, you, you, know, you, you have know an association with Beth Salem, you know, so. Yeah, you know that, that Jimmy Carter wrote a book about apartheid in Israel. So Jimmy yeah, yeah. Carter already kind of preceded Beth Salem in many, by many years. I don't think that people even know what Beth Salem is unless they're involved in the Middle East um, world. Um, you all know what B'Tselem means, right? God created man in the B'Tselem of God, in the okay. image of God. So B'Tselem is from that sentence, the idea of man and man as a, as a creature of God. And therefore, to be that, to be elevated to that position, there is an, an, a concern for honesty and, and humanity and, and kindness and goodness none of which we can see in the current Israeli government. So um, I, <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna be earth changing. I think it's important that more organizations understand that Israel is an apartheid because it is. I may never be allowed back into my country, which of, of which I'd like to tell you, I am third generation on my mother's side. So it's, it's quite a sacrifice not ever being able to go back. Daphne, uh, thanks for joining us today. Any last words for us? I'll tell you what, the hour just shot by for me. Thank you. How would you like to close for us? Um, I don't really have a prepared, like, what, what, what can I say? I mean, I wish that uh, if COVID were over and we could all get together and change the political world so that, well, maybe now that uh, the orange menace is gone, we might have something more reasonable. What worries me about Biden and Harris is that they are blinded to some extent by the Zionist myth. And I'm hoping that they being slightly more reasonable will be able over time to overcome um, the fallacious constructs of the Zionist myth. You held off for the whole time before you called uh, the previous president here, the Orange Menace.